Our moderator for tonight's discussion is Justice Ken Wise of the 14th Court of Appeals. Justice Wise is an avid Texas historian. He is an adjunct professor of history and government at Houston Baptist University. He has written several journal articles and given dozens of speeches on all aspects of Texas history. Justice Wise serves on the State Historian Committee, the Archives Committee, and the McNeil Fellowship Committees of the Texas State Historical Association. He is a trustee of the Texas Supreme Court Historical Society and a member of the Supreme Court Task Force on Historic Court Record Preservation. He is also a member of the Delgados Associate Board of the Bryan Museum in Galveston, Texas. He also hosts the award-winning Texas History Podcast, Wise About Texas, which has over 500,000 downloaders in 125 countries worldwide. <laughs> I am one of those 500,000. If you haven't already, I highly encourage you to listen to the Wise About Texas podcast. His latest episode is about the bilocation of Sister Maria and her relationship to the Humano Indians. She may have given them the first chili recipe, and I'm assured by both Harrigan and Wise that that recipe did not include beans. Yeah. <laughs> Our speaker tonight is Stephen Harrigan. Harrigan has devoted much of his life to exploring and explaining Texas, ever since his family crossed the Red River from Oklahoma in 1953. He is the author of numerous works of nonfiction and fiction, including the critically acclaimed novels, A Friend of Mr. Lincoln, Remember Ben Clayton, and the New York Times bestseller, The Gates of the Alamo. Yeah. He is a longtime writer of Texas Monthly and an award-winning screenwriter who has written many movies for television. His latest book, Big Wonderful Thing, A Sweeping Narrative of Texas from Prehistory to the Present, was published October 1st, 2019 by the University of Texas Press. And that 5.2 pound history of Texas is <laughs> <laughs> much available to discuss tonight. Please welcome Stephen Harrigan and Judge Kim Watt. I speak for Steve when I say thank you and good night. <laughs> uh, um, great, great to be here in Rockport. Rockport uh, is so beautiful. It's always been one of my favorite spots in Texas. It's uh, unfortunately uh, our most recent example of the resilience of Texans, but also fortunately, and you all have done a great job. And it looks better every time I come down, and I come down to your lot. Uh, thanks to Jackie Chandler, everybody, Pam, everybody the staff for having us at this beautiful place, one of the most beautiful houses in Texas. Um, I told Steve walking up, maybe we should do this from the front porch, make everybody sit on the grass. <laughs> 1885 style, that would be great. Uh, it's a great pleasure of mine to be one of, with one of the finest authors in Texas. Uh, Chandler gave his biography, he understated it. Uh, Steve Harrigan is a real deal, and it's a real pleasure to be here with you, Steve. Thanks for being here. 5.2 pounds. The first thing I did, <laughs> the first thing I did when I got this book was weight it, and it was 5.2 pounds. And it's a lot of Texas history, so I, I saved a lot of time. I didn't have to go to the gym for a month. As I did. <laughs> if you just hold it like this, you get all the workout you need. Uh, here, some of the reviews of this book. One called it as good a state history as has ever been written. Another describes the book as I love this brimming with sass. Intelligent, trenchant intelligence, trenchant analysis, literary acumen, and juicy details. That's a good one. But my favorite is uh, the, author, the writer that said, Harrigan essentially is to Texas literature what Willie Nelson is to Texas. <laughs> oh, wow. No pressure, Steve. <laughs> uh, you grew up around here. I did. I grew up in Corpus uh, from uh, age 10 to uh, 17, I guess, mm -hmm. when I went to college. So I'm very, very familiar with this area. And, Any stories uh, you want to share of Corpus back then that you could tell? There were some people who, who enjoyed rolling bowling balls down the Harbor Bridge. No. <laughs> Well, tell us how this project came about. Uh, sure, and, and I want to just uh, 
you know, redouble what Kim says about it. Thank you everyone for the for coming tonight, for the great hospitality here, for yeah, everybody who put this together. And thank you especially to Ken, who's like, we've done this a couple times. Uh, he's the world's greatest interlocutor. I never uh, tell anyone. He really, he really knows the subject as opposed to me. I just sort of <laughs> take, this, take my way through this book. Uh, but I was asked to do this book uh, by UT Press, University of Texas Press. They came to me. They had felt that there was a need for a, 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 a new version or a new, you know, idea about Texas history. The last, the last major sort of sweep in Texas history that had been done that got much of a general audience was uh, in 1969, I think, when T.R. Fehrenbach wrote Lone Star, and that was, you know, 50 years ago, something like that. There have been a couple other uh, sort of sweeping histories. One, Called Gone to Texas by, by Randolph Campbell, which is very good, but it's a little bit on the academic side, I think. And then another one called uh, Passionate Nation by James Hayes, which is also excellent. But they, UT Press felt there was a need for, for something different. And they came to me and said, would you write this? And I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for asking. <laughs> Is a big state with a lot of history, and I'm, uh, you know, I'm a busy guy, and I, it just seemed uh, like a crazy idea to me. I mean, I'd, I'd written about Texas a lot, but I, you know, I got a, uh, I got a D in a history class in UT, <laughs> so that gives you an idea of my credentials for embarking upon this, this work. But I, the more I thought about it. The more I, I, I started to feel like, wait a minute, I kind of want to do that because I, I had written uh, you know, a number of books about Texas uh, historical fiction, one about the Alamo that Chandler mentioned, and uh, I had written ever since like 1973 when Texas Monthly began, I had been writing for them, and most of the stuff I wrote about was kind of history based. Uh, it never never with that much intention, but, but I just was drawn to that. I, back in the 70s, I was out there in Matagorda Bay, at the bottom of Matagorda Bay, sort of, uh, you know, probing through the mud, looking for La Belle, LaSalle's <laughs> show, which they finally found in the 1990s. And uh, so I, it was always, uh, history was always just more interesting to me than, than the stuff that a journalist is supposed to be interested in, which is the present. And, uh, so I started to think about that, about the fact that I had devoted so much of my life to, to thinking and writing about Texas history in a kind of scattershot way, to the fact that I had lived through some of this text, some of this history, as a, you know, by virtue of having been, of being old. And, <laughs> and so you know, I met Lyndon Johnson once in Corpus when I was like a 14-year-old kid, and he, uh, I got his autograph. And he, well, I remember so vividly, he, I said, Can I go again? And he pulled out this thing. There was a, the first uh, felt tip pen I'd ever seen. <laughs> and I thought, this guy is so powerful. He has people invent special pens. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, I've, I've, I've interviewed various Texas figures. I, I once had lunch with Glenn McCarthy in the lobby of the Shamrock Hotel. Wow. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I had crossed paths with some people and, and, and it lived, you know, through some things either as a, as a reporter or as just a you know, passive participant. So finally it felt like, yeah, maybe, maybe I could do this. And so I did it. Uh, <laughs> but it took me about six years. Six years. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was six. six. Uh, well, as an appellate judge, I too write for a living. Uh, some of the absolute most boring product ever produced from a word processor, and you write some of the most interesting things ever produced and have won many, many awards. Uh, how do you do it? What do you do? You just pour a cup of coffee and sit down and go, okay, in the beginning, comma. Well, I don't drink coffee. I, never, I tried it once. <laughs> I didn't like it, so I had to find other ways to sort of stimulate myself. So I drink tea in the morning. All right, that uh, but I, I don't know. I mean, it's it's. Uh, I think it would. You know, I, I think the process of of writing, you know, briefs or whatever it is you guys do, is about the same as writing 
something like this. You, you still got to make yourself do it. And uh, you can get excited, uh, you know, in a kind of creative sense, but you could also you also get frustrated because we know we have to make it interesting. <laughs> we can't make it boring. And uh, and so there's a kind of uh, there, there's a stress involved. But I feel like it's it's a lot of it's just experience. It's a lot of it's trial and error. You know, you start out, you you feel in yourself. I think with any any art form or any any skill like that you you understand something about yourself i i'm good at this or i could be good at this whether it's painting or music or plumbing or whatever you you feel an ability to that that, that might be within your, your range and so i early on i uh yeah i identified myself as wanting to be a writer and i went to to UT and got an English degree and got a job as a yard man. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I would, you know, I would be mowing my yard, mowing, mowing yards every day, and thinking about how not to mow yards, <laughs> how I could, how I could, things I could write. You know, at first I started writing poetry because it was short, <laughs> and, uh, but I began to. Uh, to think about you know, magazine articles, and uh, I remember once. I mean, the first magazine article I ever had published was I. It's like 1973, and I, I just decided I'm going to write an article for Rolling Stone. I had never written a magazine article. I'm not sure I'd ever read one, <laughs> but I wrote to Rolling Stone with this idea and said I'd like to write this article. And to my great surprise, the editor wrote back and said, "Yeah, sure, go ahead." And if we send it in, if we like it, we'll take it. And I did that, I sent it in, and they sent me $150. Wow. And that was enough to live on for about two months. <laughs> <laughs> and I just started writing it from then on. Texas Monthly was starting then. I started, you know, I started writing for them. Uh, I, I, I was working on a novel at the, t at the time. And uh, so just over time, I sort of developed kind of uh, experience-based way of how to write and uh, but there was a lot of trial and error and a lot of just banging my head against the wall because it's, it's hard you know at, at the beginning particularly because you don't you don't have a template you don't you don't know what you know what what notes you can reach and what notes you can't reach so you, a lot of it is a sort of experimentation about finding your own voice mm -hmm. and learning how you write and who you are well, all of that makes perfect sense in when you're talking about novels, magazine articles, journalism. Which, how does that translate when you try to take on history? Well, it it worked pretty well, but it but it took me a while to realize what how I could do this. I uh, I finally. I have very bad memory problems <laughs> in terms of retention. So, like, I read something and I forget it. <laughs> and so, uh, including this book, by the way. But, uh, <laughs> but, but I, my my initial idea was okay. I would I would spend a year doing nothing but reading about Texas history and taking voluminous notes. And. I did that for about two months and realized this isn't working because I've, I've taken notes but I've forgotten it. it, it you know, and I don't, so I realized I need to do it a piece at a time and that felt familiar to me uh, from having written you know, 10,000 magazine articles over the years. So I was able to, to sort of think of this, at least in my mind, not necessarily for the, you know, an objective way for the book itself, but in my mind it was a series of magazine articles. That's the that is the way I, I sort of understand the world, you know. And so when I would come to a, a, a section, I, I would say I'd be writing about, oh, I don't know, spindle top or reconstruction or something like that. It was very comfortable to me, very familiar to like, just take a couple weeks, read, you know, visit things, talk to people, and then write that section and then move on to the next one. And it, in terms of, uh, it, yeah, I've been a, a novelist as well. I've, I've been writing fiction my whole life, and obviously this is not fiction and cannot be fiction. It has to be absolutely authentic and true. 
But there are certain novelistic techniques that you can use to, to you tell the story in scenes, you tell the story through people. Uh, so to try to anticipate where I'm going to get bored, which means this is where the reader's going to get bored. So I try to like switch it around and start in a place where uh, the reader might not expect, rather than just having this sort of just dull sort of continuum to try to liven it up with, with scenes and, and episodes and character descriptions that, 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 that might be unanticipated by the reader. Well, that's an interesting, you put it, you talk about reporting the history rather than reciting the history. Right. Because I found what I like about this book is you can open it to any chapter and read an interesting story. Mm -hmm. you, can, you don't have to have you don't have to have gone back to the Spanish to read about right. something else, which is fascinating. Did that is there a point in the process where you said, okay, that's what I'm doing, that, that makes a cohesive book or uh, was it you know, there was really not much thought involved in <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to reveal all the secrets. Uh, you know, people have asked me a well, lot you know, what's the theme of this book? I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's just this history of Texas. But, but it, so, it, you know, there, the idea that I, well, I, you know, I mentioned I felt comfortable writing this way, but it wasn't, it wasn't a deliberate strategy in, in, in the sense, I just was relying on my instincts. And uh, I, you know, you'd be kind of amazed at how little in terms of outlines or anything I, that I did with this. I mean, I just sort of trusted in, in the forward momentum of the story and, and in the way that I felt comfortable telling it. Uh, so uh, I don't, I'm not sure that answers your question, but it was, it was, there, was a, there, there was less deliberation, less, less forethought, at least conscious forethought in writing this book than, than you might expect. But you did go start to finish. I did go you start did. to that finish. Was, was, yeah. I always go start to finish. That was your outline. That's the way I, I, I think. You know, you begin here and you end here. And and you mentioned, you know, the, the reporting of it. I mean, I, that's what I told the, the editor. I don't want to just I don't want to search the book. I want to report it. I want I wanted to write this book as in a way that makes sense to me as a as a magazine journalist. And so at every point. Uh, Whatever I was writing back, it was all possible. I would get in my car and I would go see that, and I would you know talk to people who could help help me out with it. And uh, that I think that's one thing that that might make this book different than other Texas histories. I think there's a certain present tense immediacy to the book, so that you know you can uh, you can kind of follow along with me as I am seeing these things. And also, there's a, a very personal element to the book throughout, and I'm, you know, I commit the cardinal sin of inserting myself into a book of history, and because it it just felt right, you know. So where it, it, it made sense for me to plunk myself down and, and sort of use my own experience to to uh, to amplify, you know, what I'm talking about. I, I didn't hesitate in doing that, which makes it different than any other history book out there, which I want to get to, but before I do that, you reminded me of something. And this is the question that everyone is going to ask and want to ask you when you're done with the book. How did you pick what to put in and what to leave out? Well, again, you think that I, I made this conscious <laughs> At some point, you had to do it. I, 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 Are you saying the draft was 5,500 pages? <laughs> <laughs> I went with what interested me, and uh, you know I knew that obviously there's the whole range of Texas history. I joke that it starts roughly with Cabeza de Vaca landing in 1528 and Rick Perry on Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I'm looking for I'm looking for personalities. I'm looking for uh, interesting, exciting things to write about. And uh, so, you know, I knew obviously there are people who have to be in the book, 
But I was all there, uh, Linda Johnson and Sam Houston or whoever, but there, there were also people who, uh, who, who might not be that well known and that, that really excited me. Well, you're the guy, the woman that you, you did your podcast I use your book as a resource. <laughs> uh, the, the woman, in the, 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 the nun in, uh, in 17th century Spain who claimed that uh, she had never left her convent, she, but she claimed that she had bilocated, uh, you know, been in two places at one time, and appeared in Texas before the Hermano Indians and, and told them that they needed to talk to the Spanish friars in New Mexico and come establish missions in Texas. And, uh, you know, she was a legend, a legend throughout the Indian people, so many Indian peoples of, of Texas for a long time. And, uh, wow, that's interesting. You know, I've read about her, I've, mentioned, I've, I've seen a, a mention of her, but, but then I really sort of delved into her life and just couldn't, I devoted almost a whole chapter to her because she was so fascinating. Uh, and, you know, there are just people like that, uh, you know, I, I would just, you know, Catherine Ann Porter, you know, the great Texas novelist, had a fascinating career and, you know, a terrible, uh, uh, you know, experience with the influenza epidemic in 1918 where she almost died and was kind of reborn almost, in, in, as she tells it, uh, coming out of that, uh, out, out of this 105 degree fever that lasted for nine days and, and was, you know, reborn as a novelist. And, uh, you know, there's so many, you know, the Branch Davidian standoff. I went on the 25th anniversary of the assault on Mount Carmel. I went to, to Waco, to Mount Carmel, to, to see what was going on there. Not much, <laughs> uh, but it was just stunning to be there. And you could see the remnants of, of the Branch Davidian complex. You could see the, the you know, little pieces of the, of the school bus that they had buried uh, as a kind of escape route that didn't quite work out. And so, you know, I just, it was just listening to my own instincts about what would make a good story, basically. And it, keeping in mind that it had to tell the story of Texas in a, in a more or less comprehensive way. Well, you have picked some interesting characters. What, uh, who was your favorite? Do you have a favorite? Uh, without a doubt, I would say Old Rip. <laughs> uh, tell, tell us about Old Rip. Old Rip was a horny toad. <laughs> and he, uh, he lived in uh, Eastland County. <laughs> uh, we're, we're in, is it in 1896, I think, they tore down the Eastland County Courthouse and decided that, and they were going to build a new one. And there was a, a discussion going on at the time that, uh, that a horny toad could live for a long time without food or water. Everybody know what a horny toad is? Or yeah. <laughs> Also known as horn lizard, horn toad, horn frog. Um, so they they put this horn toad in a, in a hollow corner stand at some of the Eastland County Courthouse. Uh, built a courthouse around it. Uh, I said 30, and bad bad with dates and numbers, but 30, I think 32 years later they had to tear down that courthouse. So a big crowd gathered to see if the uh, if the horny toad was still alive. <laughs> and they, they got down to the cornerstone and they, this guy lifted this thing out that looked like a little dry leaf. <laughs> but it began to twitch, supposedly. And, uh, you know, theoretically, or at least anecdotally, it was alive. And so they called it Old Rip for Rip Van Winkle. He became uh, famous throughout the nation and the world. He was taken to Washington, D.C. to meet President Coolidge. <laughs> he, was, he was brought home where he tragically was left out on the porch one night when a northern came through and he died of pneumonia. <laughs> but, you know, he, he has an interesting afterlife because they, uh, he was such a beloved horn toad that this casket company in Abilene built a little special casket. <laughs> They embalmed him, and if you go, you know, if you go as you must, 
to Eastland <laughs> County when you go, you, you go to the courthouse and look at this little viewing window, you can still see him flying the stage. So at the risk of, of getting too deep into your psyche, what does that tell us about Texas? <laughs> Why are you so in love with that? It is a great story. It is a great, and, uh, yeah, what when you're writing that, I mean, what a great story to write for a writer. But what, what, what are you thinking of in the context of Texas history, just for example? So the, again, there's not much thinking going on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, say, yeah, I guess you could say it's symbolic of Texas endurance. Or yes, there you go. But, uh, you know, but it's just kind of neat. <laughs> it's like, and sometimes you just have to put a story in for the sake of it being yes, a story. No, it's, it must be written. Uh, did, did, you touched on this earlier. But does, does the book change as you as you went through it? You know, in academic history, it never going to change. You've got your template. Yeah. But I mean, did it did it evolve in any way, or did you kind of stick to your reporting? It, I mean, it, it it's you know, a book is an organic thing. And, and it's interesting when, you're, when it takes you as long as it, it usually takes three or four years for me to write a book anyway. But you're not the same person when you start the book as when you end the book, you know. Uh, you know, it took me six years. I had things going on in my life. I had grandchildren <laughs> born. I, uh, you know, and so you, it's interesting to sort of ruminate on, on how the book takes shape more or less in pace with your own evolution as a person. And so I think, um, I, I, I'm not sure I could identify how the book changed as I wrote it. I've, I've been listening to the audio book uh, just so I could remind myself what's in it. <laughs> and, uh, by the way, there's a wonderful narrator named George Bodell who oh, yeah. the, the, the narration on this book. Uh, and uh, it's interesting to like hear my voice filtered from so, through somebody else's voice, hear my writing voice filtered through an actual voice. And uh, I feel like the book gets uh, maybe less panoramic as it goes along, or uh, maybe sort of settles in more with individual stories and characters than it did at the beginning. You know, at the beginning, particularly after maybe the, the 20th century, um, I, probably that may be because there aren't that many books that tell the story of Texas in the uh, 20th and 21st centuries. So there's no there's no conscious or unconscious sort of uh, timeline in your mind or template, and so you're kind of at large to do the book as you see fit, or in my case, as I see fit. Well, so a lot. Following up on that, you got the story of Texas from 1836, you know, to maybe 1900. Everybody has that in however you compartmentalize those stories. What's the story of Texas in the 20th, 21st century that you're talking about? What do you think that story looks like? Well, it's a story that's, that's you know, rarely been told, I think, because people are so fascinated with the revolution and the Civil War and the Indian Wars and, and the early days of oil exploration. Uh, but, you know, it's, a, it's an, I think that the, the story, there's so much to tell in the 20th century, beginning with the Galveston hurricane and flood in 1900, the spindle top the next year, uh, the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, uh, you know, the sort of battle between, you know, what kind of state Texas was going to be. Particularly interesting for me was the, the Texas Centennial Exposition in 1936, which was the 100th anniversary of Texas's uh, uh, break from Mexico, and independence from Mexico, when Texas basically told itself, okay, this is what, who we are. And it threw this amazing World's Fair in Dallas, which you, if you go to Fair Park today, and wander around and go away from the Cotton Bowl and go out to the to those old to the where the Hall of State is and those old exhibition halls, you get a sense of the scale of this thing and of the kind of uh, of, of the yearning that Texas had to be thought of not as a state 
not as a part of the of the defeated South during the Civil War, but as as really kind of a nation again. You know, if you go to the, go to the whole state which is uh, the, the sort of centerpiece building of that exposition, which is still open. And you just get this overpowering sense of, of bravado and chauvinism and confidence <laughs> and, and this, this, you know, this yearning to, to, to march into the future with its identity intact. And you know, the, uh, the interesting thing about that exposition is it's strictly an Anglo production. You know, I mean, it is a, it is the story, and I talk about this in the book, it's the story, the idea, I think, of the exposition was that Texas history was sort of over and done with, it was settled. You know, we had white people basically won. And yet, you know, that, that assumption has come under, you know, <laughs> a lot of challenges in the, in, you know, in the time since. So it's interesting to think, Will we have a, a bicentennial exposition in 2036? What will that look like? You know, will it be that same kind of, of unbothered uh, pride, or will it be a, a reckoning with a, you know, it's sometimes a very, very dark past, you know? So, you know, so anyway, that, I guess, to answer your question, the, the 20th century is, is, a lot of it is about who are we? You know, and you know, we're talking about the rise of a powerful, you know, state that still has an inferiority complex, <laughs> which is manifested in some ways in this, you know, this boastfulness and this, you know, this intense pride in who we are. Well, do you think, uh, and I want y'all to start thinking about questions that you'd like to ask him, because we're going to take questions here in just a second. Do you think uh, Texas is different? than any other place? Yeah, I do. What, what do you think makes us so different? We're real Besides the obvious that we're bigger and smarter and better. <laughs> Don't discount the obvious that we're <laughs> Because we, you know, that's part of what makes it different. And, uh, you know, geographically, you know, look at all that we've got here, you know, in terms, here we are. I just wrote this little piece for this uh, travel magazine where the point of the piece was, you know, they wanted to ask me about, they asked me what, Right about Texas, and I, I wrote about. Actually, came down here to the to the. I started the piece at the on um, the skimmer, the the hooping yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and talked about how how can this be the same place as up in the Panhandle or yeah. or in, yeah. out in yeah. New York or something? You know, this is a vast place, and uh, I, I when people ask me what what makes Texas different, I tell them go to Bucky's. Yeah. Which is a statement in itself. The rest of the that's like the Hall of State. And true, true. And then, but you look at, you know, what really struck me the last time I was there, you go in and, you know, there's. Okay, you go in and to the left, I guess there's bar a barbecue stand, mm -hmm. and, you know, which is just doing gangbuster business all the time. And then all the way to the end of the store is just Texas shtick, you know, shop. <laughs> and what's interesting to me, like I was in New York recently and I was at Times Square and I was looking at all these souvenir shops and there's, you know, replicas of the Statue of Liberty and everything. But the people who buy that stuff are Tourists. The people who buy stuff in Bucky's are Texas. <laughs> 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 so we're we're kind of doubling down on our identity on all the time. But what okay, I'm gonna challenge you. Pick one thing about Texas. Can be anything. Geography, economy, Bucky's. Yeah. What what is what defines what do, you, what do you think affects Texas then and now? Boy, that's a really tough question for somebody who doesn't think very much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, something I'd, I'd like to hear your answer. My I'll, I'll attempt it, and, and as hackneyed as this sounds, as, as truly hackneyed as it sounds, I might say the Alamo 
because symbolically that is a creation story, you know, and not many states have that. And you know, there are there are people of you know, five hundred people a day living in Texas. You know, we have what twenty seven million people here, mm -hmm. and, and not all of them. And very, maybe very few of them have ever heard of the Alamo, and most of them who go there are probably disappointed the first time they see it. <laughs> yeah, not that, all that much to see, but that is stuck in our in our national state consciousness. And you can argue what the Alamo symbolizes. It can symbolize, you know, independence and and uh, and heroism. It can it can symbolize, uh, you know. Uh, Kind of oppression, you know, to some people. But I think it it it, it has galvanized. It, it's the it's the it's the spark, you know, that created more than anything probably the Texas identity. And you know that Texas identity will always be morphing and changing. But it's got a base to start from. I think it's got a kind of mythic base to begin with. And uh, that's distinctive. I think. You know, distinguishes it from other states. What's your answer? Uh, my answer is it probably a little more esoteric diversity, but that can be the icing on the Alamo cake because yeah. it was, you know, built by Spanish on Indian land, inhabited by Indians, mm -hmm. again by Mexicans, then by Americans, then who became Texans. Right. Yeah. And the fight over how to, you know, this, there's this gigantic struggle now about, you know, re mm -hmm. redeveloping, reimagining mm -hmm. how. That to me is like our national conversation in, in, a, in a kind of atomic form. I mean, it is everything we're talking about, like in terms of identity and how to remember history, is, is encapsulated in that. And the passion that that is generated is profound. Yeah. I can personally yeah. attest to that. But you know, in terms of diversity, you know, there are 145 languages spoken in Houston, you know, the most diverse city in the country. You know, and uh, that's pretty remarkable. But you know, the question is, I mean, I, it's, a, it's an interesting question to me, will those people who speak all those languages, will they come to identify themselves as Texans? Or what, what, what will be their, their yeah. kind of... Well, do you think there is a Texan identity still? And how do we keep it? Uh, do we, Cause, well, cause, and, and I don't want to do interrupt you, but we've always been a group of diverse people We've added more diverse people, mm -hmm. but we've all become Texans of all races and all mm -hmm. everything. Well, I see a lot of different ethnicities in Bucky's. We now have a measure of Texas identity. <laughs> I know who's going to be the chair of the Bicentennial Committee. <laughs> Beaver uh, All right, let's take some questions from the audience. Or, uh, was it in your book, uh, the case of the Alamo, was, it, was there an incident, if I remember, where a, a woman beats a uh, an Indian here at Karakawa? Mm -hmm. Do you, what was your source for that? Uh, well, it's a novel. So there, there, I, think it's a, I think the scene you're talking about is a scene, or this is a, the Gates of the Alamo, is a novel I wrote it's 20 years ago. Uh, uh, there's a scene where a woman is attack, uh, she's out on, uh, is it, I think maybe Copano, I can't right. remember. Right. Yeah. Uh, she is gathering oysters and uh, she is attacked by some Karankulis. And uh, there's, no, there's no particular source that inspired that other than just the, the contention between the Anglo colonists and the Karankulis that had been going on since the Austin's colonists got here. Um, but I just tried to imagine a, a bit Your of description of the, the Indians is stuck with these. <laughs> I mean, the Karakawas were fascinating, you know. Uh, and boy, I mean, you know, my friend Sam Gwen wrote this book, Empire of the Sun and the Moon, which is about the imagine oh, yeah. oh, yeah. It's a great, great book. But I keep thinking, you know, I was talking to Sam the other night about, you know, what he's, what he was going to write next, and yeah. I almost said he ought to write the Quran about the Quran because there's lots of good sort of scholarly books, but there's no book that tells that amazing story of these people. And uh, you know, I just think it's you know the 
the history of this part of the state is is so vivid and so deep. You know, the problem is that we you know know where they came from. Yeah, right. There's some theories. I don't know if it's true that they came from the Caribbean, but I don't. That was a theory back in the day. I don't know if it's still true. Uh, and yeah, we don't know where they went exactly right. either. You know, where who, where they kind of they sort of stood out. Where they went. Yeah. Now, how many? How exaggerated? You know, there are all these. I mean, everybody commented about how tall they were. You know, but uh, I guess that must be true. But you know, sometimes you take these things with a grain of salt, just like you take the cannibalism stories about the rock was with a grain of salt. Too. What was that first article you wrote and sent to Rolling Stone? About? Uh, <laughs> yeah. It was uh, it was about armadillos. <laughs> This was like, I was living in Austin, you know, uh, in, the, in the early 70s, and the armadillo was this sort of, uh, sort of ironic totem of Austin, you know, and there were all these, all these great uh, posters by, uh, by Jim Franklin, this, this artist of showing armadillos like soaring over the highway, you know? and uh, so I, I, I just convinced this guy that there was a, uh, there's a story to be written about how Austin had sort of embraced armadillo culture. And I, so I, <laughs> I, I went and interviewed Jim Franklin and you know, wrote this 1,500 word piece. And uh, so it, beginner's luck. <laughs> <laughs> I got another. Did you um, read uh, Mitchner's book before you started? I read Mitchner's book when it came out. I reviewed it for Texas Monthly which was awkward because I later got to know Michener a little bit and I <laughs> I wasn't all that kind to the book. I mean, my, the first sentence of the review was, there are great novels and there are great big novels. <laughs> <laughs> but I ended up teaching at the Michener Center for Writers. <laughs> But I, I'm a big fan of Mitchner, but I think that is not his best book. I mean, I have to say, and it was, it's a novel. People don't really remember that. They think of it as a, as a history, but it's a, it's a novel. It's a so novel. it's, yeah. you know, he invents, you know, a tremendous amount. And his dialogue is a little wooden in my yeah. opinion. Don't you think he sort of gives out in the second half of those large books? I think he, yeah, I think he's exhausting. Yeah, I mean. You really don't have to read it. Yeah, right. I mean, like all, I mean, one of the things that I tried to bring to this book was to make the second half of the book as interesting as the first half. <laughs> because again, that's all the bloodletting is over by the time you get to like the 20th century, <laughs> except for a few isolated things. How did you know when you were finished? <laughs> I, I just, I mean, I had planned on, on finishing, you know, I, I, I looked ahead and I, I, I knew that the book itself, the, the main part of the book needed to end about the beginning of the 21st century because I didn't want to be, you know, I didn't want to be having to decide what was news and what was history. So I figured that, that the end, the, the essential ending of the book would be a Texas president, George W. Bush, at the ruins of the World Trade Center. Yeah. And, but then I felt the need for more. <laughs> and I didn't want, so I wrote a kind of epilogue where I'm basically traveling around Texas looking at stuff and thinking about things, even though I don't think much. <laughs> and uh, so it, you know, it was not a surprise to me to know that that would be the end of the book. And so, uh, and then I knew I was finished. And then I, I turned it in. And, uh, and then, then, you know, there was editing and all that kind of stuff. And then I had to read the whole thing again. <laughs> <laughs> so I know what you guys are going through if you try to read this book. <laughs> I to read it too. So it took you six years to write the book. What plans do you have for your next? Uh, midway through a new novel. Uh, because I knew that the worst thing that could happen to you as a writer is to finish something and not know what you're going to do next. So I would already arranged with my New York publisher to write a, a novel, and so I sort of, yeah, I, I was able to just sort of switch from this to that, and that's where, where my focus. Can you give us a hand? 
It's a strange novel. Uh, it, when I was, I was born in Oklahoma City, we lived there until I was five, and one of my earliest memories is of going to the zoo and seeing a stuffed leopard. And uh, that's no big deal, but it was a big memory to me for some reason. And it turned out that in 1950, a leopard escaped from the zoo in Oklahoma City, and the entire city went insane. And you know the, the Marines were out. Every every everybody with a gun was out with hunting dogs. And uh, I thought that, and so and it's basically a novel about a confused five-year-old boy <laughs> in the middle of his family going crazy and the city going crazy. <laughs> so we'll see if it works. <laughs> okay. Um, first, I want to say thank you so much for coming, and I've, been, I've even enjoyed the book more now because of the relationship to the mansion. Like, it's a, there's so much in there about the same parallels about coming from Missouri, and then um, Harriet's father, Henry Smith, who, who's in the your book, mm -hmm. um, who she inherits all this land from. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been wonderful. Thanks. Um, and then I have two questions, and you can pick which one or answer both. But one. Um, probably because I've been the person. I'm used to professors writing books like that and their grad students do all the um, bibliography and I'm amazed at your bibliography at the end of that book and um, other people are nodding. That I don't usually see from journalists. And so I'm amazed at how you did that and how you kept track of all those sources. And then my second question is, um, once again, I'm blown away by Comanches and what an influence they had on changing the course of history. Mm -hmm. um, and I think of Brian Millay's book, A War of a Thousand Deserts. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess if you want to talk about communities or how you got all those amazing bibliographic notes and you're like, by yourself. Yeah, I mean. Well, you always see his office. <laughs> 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 uh, I mean, I knew I had, I knew I had to account for myself. You know, if I, my, my I decided, um, in terms of the notes, you know, the bibliography, I decided that, and I had a lot of help in terms of like actually assembling the bibliography from the publisher, and I didn't have to do the index, but the bibliography, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I made careful notes of, of every quotation that I used. I, I, I knew I wasn't going to have, I wasn't going to note every fact that I found because that would be, you know, five notes per sentence. But every time I would quoted somebody, I would, I would, I would, I would, I had a separate document and I would, I would, you know, put in a phrase from that quote and I would write where I put it. So I had, I had this ongoing bibliography, which I really recommend. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of popular history doesn't have notes or bibliography, but I felt like, uh, particularly for somebody like me who doesn't have a track record as an historian, you know, understandably, you would want to check in and make sure that I, you know, done my due diligence. So, so it, it became a, a, just a habit of doing that, and it wasn't that onerous. It was actually kind of invigorating. You know, as far as the Comanches go, wow. What? Uh, let me let me say this about the Comanches. Uh, the, I make a point in the book uh, that there are two indelible photographs take from Texas history. One is the uh, is Johnson being sworn in on Air Force One after the Kennedy assassination. Yeah. The other is of Cynthia Ann Parker mm -hmm. in a Fort Worth photographer's studio a, a few months after she was captured. Recaptured at the Pease River. Yeah, do you know who Sandy Ann Parker is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. After she was captured at the Pease River in 1861, I think. And uh, she, it's, if, you know, the, the photographs in the book, and you can find it online, but just look at it. And it's, it so em, embodies to me the, not just the trauma she went through twice. Of having been, you know, captured as a as a young white girl by the Comanches, but then after marrying marrying Petanacona and having three children with him, and being torn away from two of those children and thrown into this other alien environment where she didn't belong, it it embodies to me the kind of 
cultural conflicts that, that, that underlie the Texas identity, you know? And, uh, you know, this, this woman who was sort of, you know, just like her son, Juana, who sort of straddled both worlds successfully, she was a victim of that kind of uh, collision of identities. And so that, that to me is kind of the most indelible Comanche moment. The another thing that was really striking to me, I was at the JA Ranch in the Panhandle, which encompasses part of the, uh, uh, this is Charles Goodnight's old ranch, and it encompasses part of the, of the, the route that the Comanches used to go to Palo Duro Canyon, which is the scene of their final defeat. And the guy there told me, if you look at a, at a satellite map, you can still see the teepee rings of that canyon. And, you know, when I think about that, and when I think about uh, the, 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 uh, the pictographs at the confluence of the Rio Grande and the Pecos, you know, some of which are, you know, these, these wonderful, strange, eerie paintings uh, that some of them are like 4,000 years old, which, you know, it's the same time the pharaohs were building their tombs in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt. And you think about how deep and rich Texas history is and how we don't, we're not really aware of that until we come face to face with something, you know, like Cynthia Ann Parker's photo or those TV rings or those pictographs that really just make it alive for you. So, uh, I don't know, I'm kind of straying from the original question, but, uh, but you know, uh, the Comanches are only one element of this you know, tapestry. You know, the Caracas are certainly another, the Caddos, the Apaches, the Demanos. I mean, there are, there are so many. I mean, this was a world that was inhabited by different people. You know, uh, they, you know their, Texas history goes back, they think, 15,000 years. Uh, uh, the Pineda edition, the uh, expedition, came along the coast of Texas in 1519. And, and drew a map of it. And in, 15, in 1528, the base of the was washed up on, on, on the Texas coast. But if you look at 1519 to only recently 2019, that's 500 years. That's all we know, really. That's all of recorded history in Texas, and yet it goes back 15,000 years. And we'll never know who these people were before that. But it's just fascinating to just let your mind linger off on who they were. Um, oceans, virtually oceans of academic ink have, have been spilled by professors at UT and just just lobbing poop bombs at TR Marinbox. <laughs> and this is a surprise to you. And I'm wondering, and it, it, it grew worse, obviously, after he passed away for this. I wonder, do you feel as though you'll be looked upon more favorably because of the bibliography and because of how you treated, you know, women or minorities and the primary focus of academic uh, historians now? Do you think you'll be cracked on this that way? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I should. You know, I mean, I think in 50 years, if anybody's reading this book, which would be delighted, I'd be delighted for that to happen. I mean, the world will change, and attitudes will change, and perceptions about all these issues will change. And so I'm sure that T.R. Fehrenbach, by the way, I didn't read Fehrenbach while I was writing this book because he's just too contagious. I mean, his, his prose is so powerful. But I, I'm sure when he wrote his book, which is now seen as a kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, narrative of, of Anglo triumph, basically. Uh, it's, it's very kind of, you know, it's a sort of racial identity book in, in, a, in an old-fashioned way. Uh, uh, but I'm sure when he embarked on it, and when he wrote it, and, and he thought that he was, he was right there with the, you know, with the times. And, uh, and I'm, you know, it, unless time stands still, unless people's thinking doesn't evolve, uh, I'm sure my book will be, will have whatever shelf life it has, and then some other book will come along that's more relevant, that's more timely, 
probably more thoughtful in a way that I can't predict, and uh, and that's fine. I mean, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm okay with that. I think that's true with, with human beings in general, so we get superannuated by events. But I don't think there will be one that's more reasonable. And, uh, I have a little personal philosophy to always be around the best at what they do whenever you can. And you all have accomplished that tonight. He's the best at what he does. <laughs>